thank you very much for coming, guys. So I have planned today as a two-hour lecture on offshore protocols on Air 2. Historically speaking, I did my PhD in Bitcoin and Ethereum, and I've been following this for four years. So who's heard of payment channels before? I feel like I get a rough understanding of what you guys know. Who's heard of payment channels? Who's heard of like Plasma? Who's heard of Roll Up? Okay, who thinks any of this is going to get delivered? Okay, cool. Awesome. So basically what I'm going to do today is give a complete overview of all of them. It is a bit of a technical talk, so I typically start off at a high level, and I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into it. So then you get you know, a good grounding of how this works. And it's all protocol based, so I'm not going to talk about APIs or implementation. So what I want to ask first is, who's ever deposited coins into an exchange? Raise your hand. Who's done trading? Most people have done trading. What's really exciting there is actually you've used an off-chain protocol. All off-chain is, is that the transactions happen locally amongst the parties and not on the global network. Now, what's the problem with using these exchanges or online services without food and custody of your coins? You know, they, they always just keep getting hacked. And this is a big deal, you know, according to Goon, in 2016, 33% of Bitcoin exchanges have been hacked, give or take that number. But when they do get hacked, it can be a big deal, you know, Mount Gox lost 850,000 Bitcoin, Bitch Phoenix lost, uh, oh, Bitch oh, Phoenix is there, yeah, 120,000 Bitcoin. So, um, that's a pretty big deal. So what's the whole point of these off-chain protocols? Why do I mention this for? Well, everyone always talks about it as a scalability solution. But really the goal is, is there a way to keep the transactions off-chain? So they're not on the blockchain, but as a user, I still have self-custody. So I don't have to trust that online platform. I can deposit my coins, I can trade back and forth, I can play CryptoKitties or I don't know, Bitcoin Chess, whatever you want to play. But I don't have to trust that website. That website's job is only to coordinate the transactions. If we can achieve that, that's really cool. Because then you can use the internet, you know, the real internet of money, without having to trust anyone on the internet. So how can we do this? Let's find out. So this is sort of the makeup for the talk today. Um, I may skip over some of it, give or take time, because we're only here till nine. So I'm going to talk about channels first, and then I'm going to jump over to those commit chains, those are the plasma. So this is probably actually the only talk I've ever done that covers everything. So it's, yeah, it's quite extensive. So as I mentioned, you know, why off-chain? Why is off-chain exciting? Like, who's listened to a blockchain talk before where they claim they could do like 50k TPS? Okay, who believed that? Okay, great. That's why I sent this big full number out there, just to be a bit cheeky. But with off-chain, you know, there's actually some possibility that may be or may or not be true. So hopefully by the end of this, we can all argue or agree whether that's the case. But the intuition is that, is the only scaling solution where 99% of transactions are off-chain. They never interact with the global network. If you achieve that, then you know, you bypass all the block latency, you don't care there's a 10 megabit block, and you bypass the network fees as well. Cool, so that's all the channel-based networks. So what is a channel? A channel is between two parties, all that's involved. I don't have a little baby there, but I try to make it more professional. But um, we have Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob are going to set up a channel. So one Alice or Bob or both can deposit coins into this channel. In our example, Alice has deposited one coin, and Bob has deposited zero coins. And now it's set up. So the blockchain's taken away, and we don't care. What's going to happen is that Alice and Bob can basically agree how to distribute that coin amongst themselves. So that's the all chain progression. So let's take an example. Alice is going to send Bob one coin. Okay? Now Bob has the coin. And we're going to see how that works under the hood. But basically, Alice will sign off on it, give it to Bob and say, Bob, you're now the owner of that one coin. Now Alice has zero coins, and Bob has one coin. Now if Bob wants to send the coin, then what can happen then is Bob can send the coin back. So basically we just repeat this process. It's this cute little animation. That's exactly how a payment channel works. I take a black box, we put coins in, and all we're doing is redistributing ownership of that coin. And when we're finished, if Bob has the coin, he can convince the blockchain that he owns the coin, and then simply withdraw. 
Now, this is a payment, you know, payment channel example, but it could be used for auctions, casino games, or even potentially fix AE voting. These channels tend to be useful when it's only for a small fixed set of parties. So if you're building a game that requires 10 million players, a channel's not going to work for that. If you're building a casino game between two players, it's probably useful for that use case. Cool. But that seems like a bit of magic, you know. What happens if Bob goes offline? Or I guess in this case, what if Alice goes offline? Okay? So channels should always guarantee this thing called balance security. If I have a coin in this channel, I don't have to trust the counterparty whatsoever. As long as the blockchain is reliable, I can always get my coin back. Okay? So how does this work? It's a dispute process. Okay? So in this case, Alice will trigger a dispute. And then the blockchain is going to provide a fixed time period for both parties to respond. So Alice can submit evidence, and Bob can submit evidence. Okay? And then after the dispute process, the blockchain will say, well, what evidence, of, what, what evidence am I going to believe? And there's a way for the blockchain to be convinced that the evidence Alice gave was indeed the latest balance. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if there are any questions during this talk, let me you know. So just raise your hand or yell at me. You know, it's always very important. It's more like a workshop than a talk. You know, that's like a lecture. Cool. And then after that fixed time period, that dispute period, the blockchain will say, well, Alice deserves the coins according to the evidence. Then Alice can simply withdraw her coin and go on her way. And that's cool. If Bob never replies, then Alice can always get her coins back out. Okay. So that's the high level idea of a channel. Does anyone have questions for that, by the way, before we continue? Yep. How do you verify the evidence that the both crown parties provide? We'll get to that. So you'll not be more clear when you look at it under the hood. Cool. But everyone's sort of okay with the concept so far. Awesome. Cool. So how do we build these? How do we construct these channels? Now in Bitcoin, there's payment channels, duplex micro payment channels, and there's lightning channels. Then in the Ethereum world, we have Raiden, Sprite, Perun, Kodifexo, Kitsun, etc., etc. Now, what is exciting is that payment channels were actually this slide's a bit wrong. So it was recently discovered payment channels were discovered in 2011 by a person called Hashcoin. But most people call it Scalemin from 2013, so I'm going to fix that at some point. But as we're going to see, we're going to go through each construction one by one. So in the first one, it only supports one-way payments, Spielman channels. The second one supports five directional payments, but it's a bit awkward. Then the last one is how Lightning works today. And as you're going to see, it's great and it's also a bit awkward at the same time. So Spielman one-way payment channels are really exciting. They're actually one of my favorite constructions. So how does this work? So only one party is going to fund this channel. So Alice is going to create a transaction, broadcast it to the network, and lock up one coin. And this can be redeemed if one of the two conditions are satisfied. Alice can simply wait until time t, and then she'll automatically get a refund. Or Alice and Bob can authorize to spend the coin immediately. Okay? Two very simple conditions. Okay, so as I said, all this after time T, or all this involved can cooperate. So all this broadcasts this to the network and it gets confirmed. Now we can start doing payments. How does this work? Okay, so all this will create a new Bitcoin transaction. Okay, where all this is going to get back 0 0.9 Bitcoin, and Bob's going to get 0 0.1 Bitcoin. All this will sign this and give it to Bob. Now, Bob can make one of two decisions. Bob can sign this immediately, broadcast it to the network, and redeem his 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Or, he can just wait. Because he's aware that others can't claim this until time t. The coins are locked up for five hours, he doesn't have to do anything for four hours. So he'll just keep it private for now. Okay? And then, in the channel, all this might have 0 0.9, and Bob has 0 0.1. Now, how do we do a second payment? I guess it's pretty clear what's going to happen now. All this is going to authorize a second transaction. So you'll sign it, give it to Bob. All this is going to get back 0 0.7 Bitcoin, 
I'm both going to get 0 0.3 Bitcoin. So you did a payment of 0, you know, 0 0.3 Bitcoin. And again, Bob can just make that exact same decision. You can either keep this private or sign it and broadcast that immediately. It's a very straightforward protocol. And you can just keep doing this. And now actually what you can do is delete the previous transaction he got. All he cares about is the latest payment he got from all this, because that represents his balance in the channel. Cool. Now I've lost your ticket away, and there's no activity. And I'll just keep sending transactions in this fashion. So we call this replaced by incentive. Bob has the incentive to only sign the transaction that will give him the most money. Okay? And that's really cool. So he'll sign it, bam, and then he gets his coins. And that's basically how one way payment channels work. And what's also exciting about one way payment channels, they are the only payment channel construction where Alice can go offline and none of her coins are at risk. And we'll see later on some of the risks that can occur. But this is the only example where the sender can go offline and there's no kind of party risk. Cool. And the worst case scenario, what if there's no activity? What if Bob never claims his payment? Well, one payment channels typically have a fixed expiry time. But Alice is always eventually refunded. She waits until time T. She can then broadcast a refund transaction and get back her one coin. So Alice is never at risk. The only thing she you know, is at risk is that her coins are locked up for a while. Cool. But what if we want a bidirectional channel? You know, what if Bob wants to send the coins back? Now what I'm going to present are two protocols, and you don't have to remember how they work. They're more for historical context. This is the best thing we had in 2014 before Lightning. Okay? So this is replaced by Timebuck. Every time we change payment traction, we're going to reduce that time lock. Okay? So, let's give an example. Always is going to again fund the channel. And now this can be redeemed if one of the following two conditions are satisfied. Okay, Alice is either refunded on or after block 20, or Alice and Bob cooperate, again, the coin can be spent immediately. Cool. So how does this work? Alice is going to you know, send a transaction, give it to Bob, and it's going to work exactly the same way before. But now, Bob's transaction can be redeemed on day 19, or block 19. So we just decommend that refund time from 20 to 19. Okay, so the payment is only valid on block 19. Now he receives another payment, and we don't have to worry about the lock time. We can keep sending coins Bob's direction. And then we want to change direction from Bob the Alice. What do we do? Bob's going to send a transaction and get out the Alice. But this time, we're going to decommit the lock time by to 18. Okay? Now, why are we doing this for? This is how we revoke or invalidate the previous state of the channel. The idea here is that there's always one transaction that I can get in the blockchain first. And that's based on the fact that, you know, the re most re re recent receiver. But what are the issues with this? Okay? In this example, the, you know, the problem is very obvious. One, Alice can't get her coins until block 18. If she doesn't get it in, then Bob can reverse the payment by block 19. And that sucks. Another problem is that every time Alice and Bob can change payment direction, that lot of time is coming you know, closer to the present time. If you change direction 19 times, you have to close the channel. So that sort of sucks a little bit. You know, it's not a great solution. But it is a solution, you know, it works. So then there's this academic paper called Dupac Fit Repayment Channels. I have not even heard of this, by the way, DMC. Cool, awesome. Okay, that's the good one ever, ever implemented. Um, so the idea of DMC is that there's two one-way payment channels. One the Alice the Bob, and one the Bob the Alice. And then there's this idea of an invalidation tree. Because what we're going to do is get the two one-way payment channels, create them, do lots of payments, destroy them, and then recreate them off-chain. So it's a bit like a channel factory. Okay? So as I mentioned, 
There's two transactions, or two channels, Alice the Bob and Bob the Alice. And the idea here is that Alice can pay Bob in her channel, and Bob can pay you know, Alice in his channel. But we'll eventually get to the point where in Alice's channel, she has no more coins to send to Bob. In Bob's channel, she, you know, he has no more coins to send to Alice. Well, that's actually a typo in the slide. I need to fix that. But anyway, the point is that the both channels are exhausted. They can't send any more coins in it. But Alice has a coin, and Bob has a coin. So we're just going to destroy that and recreate it. And this is basically how the construction looks. So in the middle is that invalidation tree. And that's a transaction with a fixed expiry time, just as we've seen before. And every time we destroy the one we pay the channels, we create a new tree, and then we refresh the channels over there. And we just decommit that time. Okay, and we just keep repeating that process. And I won't go into the detail because no one's ever going to implement it. Actually, raise your hand if you'd want to implement this. Would anyone want to build this? Exactly. And that's why it never got built. Yeah, but it did solve the problem. You know, it, it was historically important. So then in 2015, you had Poon and Taj. They're obviously looking at these protocols. They're doing a startup. Then they thought, how can we solve these problems? You know, how can we get rid of this expiry time? As you can see here, by day 100, we have to close the channel. How do we fix that problem? And there's also this limit of throughput. You know, and every time we change payment direction, we get closer to present time. Can we just get rid of that problem altogether? That's what Lightning fixed. Okay. So Lightning at a high level is actually a very straightforward idea. A Lightning channel. All this involved, boom, have a state. Okay? Alice has a state, and basically the state, by the way, is just Alice's balance and Bob's balance at any given time. So the state of the channel is both of their balances. So Alice has one that only she can broadcast, and Bob has one that only he can broadcast. Okay, so every time we do a payment in Lightning is a two-step process. Okay, Alice is going to sign a new state and give it to Bob. And Bob's going to sign a new state and give it the Alice. And this is just their new balance. You know, Alice has one coin, Bob has one coin. And then what they're going to do is revoke the old state. So that the revoked state should never get broadcast to the blockchain. And what you end up with is one state that should always be broadcast to the network, because that's the valid balance of both parties. And then you end up with this set of revoked states that should never get broadcast to the network. So we call this replaced by revocation. Because we agree the new state, we revoke the old one. And we're going to see how we do that in a second. Okay? And of course, what if all this stuff's cooperating in this case? What if all this goes offline? You know, Bob can try to close the channel using a revoked state and try to reverse payments and get more coins than he deserves. Okay, so he broadcasts the first one where he still has money. And now you have that dispute process. And now both parties have an opportunity to submit evidence. What is evidence of lightning? So who's on the justice transaction before? Over there, got the lightning dev. Cool. <laughs> so basically what Alice is going to do is she's going to broadcast something called a justice transaction that has enough evidence to prove that that was indeed a revoked state and it should never have got broadcast. Okay. So she gets her justice transaction and she sends it to the network. The blockchain will get the justice transaction and say, yep, that was indeed revoked. So what happens now? Well, because it's replaced by revocation and there's lightning, we actually penalize Bob. So all this is going to get every coin in the channel. So if you try to cheat, you try to you know, take more money from the channel than you deserve and you're caught, you will lose money because of that. Okay. But then the question is, how does this look like under the hood? You know, what do the Bitcoin transactions actually look like at a conceptual level? So again, you have this funding transaction, we've locked in one Bitcoin, and it requires a signature from Alice and Bob to spend the coin. And then we have, our, these, we have a commitment transaction for Bob and a commitment transaction for Alice. All that really is, is their state. So the first output in that case, I should quote here. The first output is Bob's balance. Okay, that's Bob's transaction 
when he balked or broadcast this, and that's his current balance. Now, there's two conditions there. Okay, so if this transaction gets in the blockchain, Bob has to wait until time t to get his coins out. Or, if Alice can reveal the pre-image of a hash, so if Alice can reveal a secret, then she can take Bob's coins immediately. Then the second output is just Alice's balance. And because Bob broadcasts this, Alice can take her money out immediately. Now the second transaction is symmetrical, so I haven't even bothered projecting that. Now before I continue, does anyone have questions at this point about how this may work? Any questions? Cool. Okay, cool. So we didn't get that, don't worry about it, because it actually is quite a complicated protocol. It's one of my rants about my being. So he broadcasts this, so it gets accepted to the network. Then the justice transaction that Alice would broadcast simply reveals the secret S. And then the blockchain will say, well, some Bob's trying to close the channel. For some reason, Alice knew the secret S. So that must have meant that this was a revoked state. And if it's revoked, then Alice can steal all the coins in the channel. That's basically how lightning works at the hood. Cool. Now, as you're going to notice, that's probably the most complicated thing I'm going to show tonight. And as you go through the years, the protocols just get more complex and complicated. Okay? And that's really because Bitcoin was never designed for this in mind. In the sense that Satoshi Nakamoto had a rough idea that payment channels would exist. But they had no idea what Bitcoin needed to support them. Okay? So sometimes, it feels like this picture, and some people don't like it. But sometimes it feels like you know, you're sort of beating Bitcoin in this mission to get this to work. Now that is quite an elaborate solution to solve the problem. So then when you go to the Ethereum world, you think, well, what if we have this smart contract language that was a bit more expressive? Can we build this in a more simpler fashion? And we can. It's called replaced by version. And it's so straightforward, it just takes one slide. Okay? So the idea is that every time Alice and Bob do a payment, Alice will sign it, Bob will sign it, and then we just increment the counter. State 1, state 2, state 3, state 4, state 5. When there's a dispute, you just send a state with the largest counter. Whatever counter, you know, whatever state has the largest counter, the blocks will say, yep, that must be the real state. You know, very straightforward. And that's important, you know. Uh, it just looks like this. You, know, you trigger a dispute. You send you know, state i, state i plus one, then the blockchain will say, yep, that's the latest state. Then Bob and Alice will get their coin respectively. You know, there's no punishments. And that's what makes it really good. You know, there's no expiry time, no throughput limitation, you know, we don't actually have to sign a transaction. It's easy to support watch powers, it's not very complicated. So who here thinks they can build that? You know, raise your hand if you think you can build that system. Anyone? Okay, you're sort of like half half. Okay, cool. I think you can build it. I think you can build it. Be more confident. <laughs> but the important thing is that this isn't new for the Bitcoin community either. There's real, real attempts to get replaced by version of that counter idea in the Bitcoin. So this is a slide I stole from Rusty. He gave a talk in 2018. And you'll notice in the slides, they have actually the description for replaced by version. It's a protocol called L2. Okay? So they want to get this into Bitcoin. And this is basically what it looks like. You know, you trigger a dispute, then you can replace the transaction with the counter, and after the dispute time it. So for this to work, we need an upgrade called Sekash no Wimpnet. But that's sort of a controversial upgrade to Bitcoin. So if anyone asks you about it, please tell them the upgrade it. Because it would make building might be much easier. Anyway, so that's the end of how payment channel constructions work. If you want to learn more, I I built a fellowship game in them once. I think like basically this time last year I wanted to learn, you know, how easy is it to build a game in a state channel. So you built Battleship. Who's heard of who's played Battleship before, by the way? Okay, we've all played Battleship, awesome. It's actually really hard to build in this smart contract. But anyway, that's like that's basically the idea of a channel. So now you just have you know, five years of actually longer than five years now, I guess. That's actually eight years from 20, 20, 2011. We're in the phase of five, 20 minutes. So if someone went over your head, don't worry about it. As long as you have the rough idea, then after this you can go away, you can read about it, you'll have a rough idea of what's going on. 
You know, the whole point of talks to get a rough idea and then you can dive into the detail by yourself. Okay, so how do we build a network? So far, I've only spoken about two parties. So how do we build a network of channels? So what we need to do is go over one basic humble primitive, and it's called the humble conditional transfer. Okay? And it's going to look really stupid. Now you want to look at this and think, why would you ever do this for? But it'll, it'll make sense in a few slides. So what Bob's going to do is generate a secret R, which is a random number, he'll hash it, and he'll share the hash with us. No hitch. Then what Bob is going to do is set up a conditional transfer. So he'll say, Bob, if you can reveal the secret before time t, you know, you get the coin, you get in this case one Bitcoin. You know, that's, that's a huge reward for revealing the secret. Now in the cooperative case, Bob can reveal the secret R, and then Alice can cooperate and just remove the condition. So Alice learns the secret, and Bob, oh sorry, yeah. Alice learns the secret, and Bob gets the one coin. What if Bob doesn't cooperate? What if Bob gets this, or what if Alice gets the secret? Or sorry, what if Alice doesn't get or what if Alice doesn't cooperate? In this case, you know, Bob sends the secret to Alice, then Alice says, nah Bob, no way. I'm not going to give you the money. You know. How do we make sure Alice is forced to give that one coin across? Again, we have another dispute process. You're going to hear about dispute processes for the next hour. So what happens is that Bob will, or in this case, Bob will trigger disputes. Bam. Oh, sorry. Alice will trigger disputes. Let's decide. Oh, yeah, sorry. So what happens is that Bob has until time t to reveal the secret and claim the coin. So, you know, the blocks are taken away. He's not doing anything. He reveals the secret and the condition. The blockchain will say, well, Alice agreed, you know, to this condition. Bob satisfied it. Bob revealed the secret and he gets the one coin. So we actually reuse the blockchain to enforce this. To make sure that, you know, there's a fair exchange of money for information. Cool. So what can we do with this humble condition of transfer and derivatives? We can build the lightning network. So who's actually trying to use the lightning network here? Oh, we have last time we did, yeah. Okay, cool. So you've all tried, well, some people have tried to use it. I do recommend trying it. It's an interesting user experience. You know, it's good and bad. But what is cool, though, is now we have Alice, Bob, Carlin, and Dave. Alice has a channel with Bob. Bob has a channel with Caroline. And Carlin has a channel with Dave. And what we can do is use our conditional transfer to synchronize a single payment across those channels. So Alice can pay Dave by a Bob and Caroline without any counterparty risk. There's no trust whatsoever between the parties. Okay, so what it would look like is Alice sends the coin to Bob, Bob gets another coin in his channel and sends it to Caroline, Caroline gets another coin and then sends out the deal. But the question is, how do we do this in a way where we don't have to trust each other? Cool. This is called a house time lock contract. So what's going to happen is that Alice will set up a conditional transfer with Bob. Oh, sorry. Dave actually sends over the, you know, the hash of the secret first. And then I will set up the conditional transfer. And so he'll say, Bob, if you're going to reveal the secret before time T3, you get the coin. And then Bob will say to Caroline, Caroline, if you're going to reveal the secret before time T2, you get the coin. And of course, Caroline's going to do the exact same thing with Dave. Dave, if you're going to reveal the secret before time T1, you get the coins. Now, obviously, Dave knows the secret. So what Dave's going to do is reveal the secret to Caroline, and then get the coin from Caroline. And Caroline has the secret, she gives it to Bob. And of course, Bob's going to do the same thing to Alice. And now we've just synchronized a single payment across multiple paths, or multiple channels. Now, what if Caroline doesn't cooperate and remove the condition? Well, we just do the exact same thing we did before. Dave gets, you know, the signed promise from Caroline. He gets the secret, and he just reveals it on the blockchain. Then he forces Caroline to give him the money. Now, if Caroline's lost one coin, she has to continue the protocol, and then take it from Bob. 
So you force Carla into this, and to reassure she has to continue the protocol, otherwise she loses out the coin. So that's really cool. We can skip this one. <laughs> that's cool. That is basically how the Lightning Network works under the hood. We have our payment channel, which is described before, Lightning channel is replaced by revocation, and it's basically just doing these kids TLCs under the hood. When you set up a path, that's exactly what it's doing. Now what about the GUI file in the opening? Okay, what's good about this is that if the Lightning Network evolves, you don't require a direct, you know, pairwise channel between every party. You know, that me and Megan have a channel, and she has a channel with someone else, I can pay if you buy a Megan. I don't need another channel with me. The bad thing is that you do have this thing called a free American call option. So what if we're in the Lightning Network, you know, I lock in a trade for Bitcoin, you lock in a trade for Litecoin. Dave has the opportunity to spook it. This trade is set up for the next hour. If Dave doesn't reveal the secret, it will just expire and the trade will cancel. So it's very hard to build you know, immediate trades using this technique. You know, it's locked up for an hour, you can take advantage of the exchange risk, or the exchange rate. Another problem is collateral lock up for every hop. You know, the open a channel, Alice has to put in coins, and Vault may also have to put in coins. Now these coins are locked up for that channel. And they could be locked up for you know, one or two weeks, give or take the dispute process. But what is nice is that there's a routing network. And it's actually truly peer to peer. You know, three or four people here are writing over the Lightning channel. I know Google the Lightning channel, you can join this network and you can collect fees for routing payments on the network. And the graph gets big enough, last night I checked it was like 10,000 nodes or more, or 10,000 channels, sorry. That's because like 30,000 channels now. The bigger that graph gets, the more liquidity there is, the more revenue you can earn, and the more censorship resistant it actually becomes. So it actually is a truly censorship resistant peer to peer routing network. And it's optimistically lightning fast. Everyone will cooperate, so we done in a second. And the payment's basically considered confirmed. But it's not very good for merchants, and we'll look to be in in a second. Okay, now, we have network of channels, how do we find the paths? Um, for this, I'm not a complete expert. No, I have some co co colleagues who know about this better. What I can't explain is the rough idea of what's going on. Given the underlying blockchain, you can actually work out all the channels on the network. You know, you create a transaction, you open a channel, everyone in this room can see that. So you can build up the entire network topology by just looking at the network. Now I can find all the 10, you know, 30,000 channels and how they're all connected on the graph. And they should be, you know, effectively scalable. Now there's two ways to do routing. The first is source routing. I look at the topology and I say, well, I want to send coins to deep. I look up the path myself, then I tell every hop, you know, I send it to Megan, I say, Megan, send it to deep. Okay, that's source routing. I pick the path up front. Or there's per hop routing. Where I give the job to Megan and then she has to say, well, what's the next best hop? How do I eventually reach deep? So every hop makes a decision on what the next hop will be. Now, interestingly, in practice, most people have implemented source routing. That's sort of a white and write of them. But in academia, they prefer per hop routing. So there are like two papers there that really teach you how to do that. I don't really understand why there's this divide in your preferred techniques. Maybe this is easier to build and they're a bit busy. Maybe this is just too cumbersome and not realistic. I don't know. But uh, there is a clear difference between you know, theory and practice. Now, there's two properties I do want to highlight, though, because this is really, you know, the crunch of routing. It's first, volume privacy. You know, Alice is selling coins, the ball card, and, oh, sorry. Yeah. So basically, Alice is trying to find a path to deep. As you can see, there's a path between Bob and Carla. She needs to make sure there's enough coins in the right direction that that path can be fulfilled. So when she talks to 13 different paths, she doesn't want to reveal how much she's standing. You're supposed to keep that secret until the last moment. The other one is transfer privacy. So Carline should have no idea this payment came from Alice. And Carline should have no idea this payment is destined to Dave. From Carline's perspective, she should get an encrypted log, decrypt it, pass the job on, and that's it. She should have no idea what this path is. Okay, so that should be privacy preserved. 
And that's actually very difficult to achieve in practice. Okay, so that's the end of channel BS networks. Does any questions at that point? Yep? Uh, the fee for the transaction, mm -hmm. is that based on the length of the route? Like on the yeah, this is tricky actually. So um, the question is the following. When Alice is setting the path, how does she determine the fee? You know? How does she make sure that Bob will get paid enough money, money and Connie will be paid enough money to accept it? So there's different ways to look at this. The implementations today are focused on the shortest path. But that may or may not be you know, the cheapest path. And I think maybe Alice, Bob, Carla, and Dave, it will cost me a dollar. But maybe there's a longer route across 10 different paths. There's actually you know, 30 cents or 20 cents. It's cheaper to survive. So fees in the current like, network aren't a problem because we won't really get any money for it. But long term, it will become a problem. And it may not be short of top. You know, maybe there's a longer route that's actually cheaper. Yeah, and then you gossip it. And it actually changes in real time as well. So one thing is that maybe you know, Alice and Bob have the channel. You know, Bob has two coins, Alice has zero coins. Now, Alice can't make any money in this channel at the moment. So what she could do is offer negative fees, where she encourages people to route by all the Alice, the re the channel. So then you can get in the negative fee world as well. The mind starts to explode and how that's going to work. But yeah, that, that, that answer is okay. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah? So if I have a channel to yeah. and I send you all the money, yeah. from that point onward, I have every incentive to cheat. Because that, all I get is the money that you tend to lose. Yeah, I think it's a lot of cheat is about cheating. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. So, yeah, so Harun's comment is that. Alice and Bob have 1,000 Bitcoin in the channel. And Alice has sent all the coins to Bob. And Bob has 1,000 coins. Now, if I were Bob, I would go off and buy a Lambo. You know, 1,000 Bitcoin could definitely get me a Lambo. So he said, what well, if Alice now has this incentive to cheat? And she does have an incentive to cheat because she has nothing to lose. So Bob has to remain online and make sure that Alice doesn't cheat. And I'll talk about that at the very end. Yeah? The other one is that you have to stay every channel you want to stay. A lightning network, despite how many sort of bait like, no one uses it. And if, if you're learning, you do use it. If you're learning, you route fees, basically you get nothing. So it's kind of waste, waste of time routing them, because it's the amount of traffic so low. Yeah. So, I mean, another way to look at it, yeah. Kind of yeah. Of it. So how yeah. do you incentivize, like, your grandma to use lightning? So she ain't going to go stay, so she's, she's not going to be boss. Yeah, I think another way to look at it is when did the fee market start in Bitcoin? So fees weren't a thing until 2015, 2016, six or seven years after it was invented. So right now, no one's considered Lightning as a serious payment network for another couple of years. This is a practice experiment to see how well it's going to work. But even if people consider it, you still can't be your grandma to go to Lightning network. She yeah. Well, you're, 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 yeah, so by the end of it, I don't think your grandma has to be on Lightning. And that'll be very clear at the end. Lightning is going to be more for professional routing, uh, professional routers. You're going to basically join the network to collect fees. And what you're going to do, because you're a tacky, you're going to look at the network, you're going to look at the graph and think, well, if I join this connection, I connect these hops up, and I can maximize my profit. So I think it's not for your ground. I would argue that's not even for payments. It's, it's not, much better for companies. The lightning is not for scaling Bitcoin, that's what they're just using. It is for scaling Bitcoin. We'll see. It's not for like... We'll see, you'll see. I mean, I just don't even for... I'm sorry, Bitcoin's not even for payments. Yeah, anyway, we'll get, we'll get to that. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Everyone's sort of happy so far. Okay, so now I'm going to get to Haroon's point. So, how do well the payment channels work for actual payments? So let's consider payment channel hubs. You know, this is the motivation why commit chains are so promising, like Plasma, Rollup, etc. So if you're a payment channel hub, you, have a, you, know, you require a big pot of money. Okay? So before I can be a payment channel hub, I need a big pot of money. But every time a customer comes along and I open a channel, I need to decide when I make a lot of money and how to allocate that to the customers. So in this case, all of us want to get two coins from the operator. And all of us won't put up any coins whatsoever. Then Bob comes along, in this case Bob's female, because I just copied the female icon. Bob will put in two coins, and the operator will also put in two coins. Then Carla comes along, you know, the operator is not like Carline, so Carline doesn't get any coins from the operator. Or Carline puts in one coin. And then Dave comes along, 
operator really likes div, so he puts in four coins for div, and div doesn't put out any coins. Okay, so let's look at this scenario and let's work out some of the problems. So the first problem is that Carline can only send. Carline cannot receive any coins on this network. Okay, so that's quite annoying if this is like an emergent scenario. Okay, it's really good if you're an exchange and Carline is a trader. Another problem is that in the Alice's case, say you receive up to a maximum of two coins. So let's just say you're going to run an event and you're going to sell 100 tickets and every ticket is a coin. What you require is an incoming capacity, which is this here, of 100 coins. So you need other people in the network to put up 100 coins in advance so you can receive that. And that's pretty really awkward. You know, they're going to be the liquidity providers for Lightning. Another issue is that as the hub, this is a bit like a hot wallet. Your signing key has to be online to sign updates in your Lightning channel. It's a bit weaker than a hot wallet because you need your customers to cooperate to store your coins. But it's not a cold wallet. Another problem is that as the operator, I have a big pot of money, I need to work out how they allocate that collateral, and I may have to charge the customer for that privilege. So I stole this from Bitfield. It cost 16,000 sats back then. They get a channel with, uh, I think that's 400,000 sats incoming capacity. So when you look at that, you don't look at that as a payment network, you look at that as a routing network. You're paying for the privilege to open it because you're going to make money by doing this. Okay? So payment channel hubs are great. They are great because there's no trust whatsoever. You do not have to trust the operator whatsoever with your money. Okay? But the collateral lockout problem doesn't really make it permissionless. Not everyone here could be a payment channel hub. You need a big pot of money before you get started. So what if we weaken the trust assumption a bit? What if we're willing to accept eventual finality? Can we do a little bit better? And this is where basically Plasma comes in. The idea behind Plasma is really straightforward. The, all the operator does is, is a bit of a minor. The operator collects off-chain transactions. They're going to create a block of transactions. They're going to get the hash and just push that to the blockchain on these little checkpoints. So let's consider an example. Alice comes along and she's going to deposit one coin into this commit chain, plasma chain, okay? And then Bob comes along, you know, hi Bob, okay? So uh, Bob is going to send Bob one coin on this you know, plasma chain. So she'll sign it and give this to the operator. The operator will notify Bob and say, Bob, you received one coin. Now the important bit here is that this is not yet final. This is not yet confirmed. Okay, so now we wait around a while for more transfers and nothing happens. And then what the operator is going to do is create a block that will only include Alice's transfer, because that was the only transfer that happened here. He creates the block, he'll get the hash, and post that to the blockchain. And what he's basically doing is a fast confirmation of his transfers on the blockchain. And he'll just keep doing that over time. Now the important bit is that Bob cannot consider this transfer final until the checkpoint is in the blockchain and he has the off-chain data where he can convince the blockchain that he has one coin in this checkpoint. Okay? And we're going to see how that works in a second. But does everyone have the rough idea? The operator's only job is to collect transfers and then once in a while he'll create a block and post a hash to the blockchain. That uh, basically does a box confirmation of all the transfers. Okay? But this raises the question, what does it mean to be secure for a commit chain? So first, it's only secure if Alice can spend her coins and no one else. It has to be self-custody. If only Alice can spend her bonds. No one else can spend her coins. And also, does it gain balance security? What if the operator disappears and goes offline and there's no new checkpoints? Can Bob get his coins out? You know, what process does he have to go through to get his coins out? And another problem is, all we're posting to the blockchain is a hash, 32 bytes. 
and we're doing this fast confirmation of potentially tens of thousands of transactions. We have to make sure that whatever is inside that hash is actually valid and correct, that there's no invalid transactions in there. So how do we do that? So there's two main designs for these plasma chains. Okay, and the way I categorize them is either a potential claim or a fixed claim. Okay, so let's consider the first one. So we have the checkpoint, and all that checkpoint is is a Merkle tree of everyone's wallets and a list of transactions. Okay, so it looks like a Bitcoin block. You know, Merkle tree of all the balances. I think it's Bitcoin is not a Merkle tree of the balances. But anyway, the whole point here is that there's this big pot of money. And it's going to say Alice owns 10 coins in that big pot of money. Now, in the finance world, that's called a potential claim. You have a potential claim to this big pot of money. You don't actually own any of the individual coins. There's no one to one value. And then in the other one, this money class for cash, the chat point, this big purple tree, every leaf in that tree is a coin. So leaf one is a coin, leaf two is a coin, leaf three is a coin. So if you're the owner of coin one, then there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping. So I can look at the big pot of money, and I can say, I definitely own that one coin. So it's a bit like a non-fungible token. Now I can look at that and say, I definitely own that one coin. Okay, so what an invalid withdrawal is processed. So let's say we have all these checkpoints, and maybe the operator cheats. The operator gives himself a coin. It gets processed in the blockchain, and he somehow gets his money out. Okay? So, in the potential claim world, in this one, here, if there's 100 coins for all the customers, and the, pot, the big pot only has 99 coins, then there's a race. You know, there's a bank run. Everyone's going to get their coins out first, because the last one to get it out doesn't get the coin. There's not enough coins there for everyone to follow. So there's fractional reserve banking at that point. Where for the fixed claim approach, if the operator manages to steal the coin, we know exactly which coin he stole. It only impacts on one user and nobody else. Okay? Because remember, in the fixed claim world, every coin has a unique identity. So the operator steals coin one, then only the owner of coin one is impacted. Okay? Any questions at this point, by the way? Cool. Awesome. I know it's quite technical, so I do apologize. Okay. So what are the fundamental problems emerging for these checkpoints? Okay. Actually, one thing I should highlight, and I don't think I highlighted it that well, the great thing about these commit chains, I have not noticed already, the operator does not put up any money whatsoever. The operator does not need to lock up any collateral of the limits. The user locks up money, and that coin will then be transferred to another user directly. So anyone in this room, at some point in the future, could run their own commission. And my vision is that it'll be like a WordPress plugin. You're running a website, you're doing all these transactions, you just install this WordPress plugin, and now your users have self-custody. Eventual self-custody. You have to wait for the checkpoint. But it's much better than what we have today. Cool. So what are some of the problems that emerge with these checkpoints or these uh, commissions? So the first problem is data availability, and that's really the killer. You know, the thing that styles this thing in the, the back constantly. So what if the operator poses a checkpoint, but they don't make the data available? Well, if the data is not available, as a user, I can't convince the blockchain what my balance is. Remember, every checkpoint here has you know, a balance for the user. If I want to withdraw my coins, I say, well, I have 70 coins, go look at this checkpoint. But if I don't have the data, then I can't post that evidence. I can't prove to the blockchain that according to this checkpoint, I had 70 coins. Okay? So the user could just forget that. The operator could be malice and just not give it. Or the operator could crash and then lose the data. You know, they could even be an extent of fault on their, on their behalf. And then of course, tech part integrity. You know, one of the hash just says party is cool and doesn't commit to an account whatsoever. Well, that sucks because uh, it's invalid and I can't use that to get my money out. 
So why do these problems even exist? You know, fundamentally, why do these exist? So when you look at a new blockchain protocol, we always assume the prover who are the miners, right? I do the proof of work, I create a block, I send everyone in this room. There are provers, and everyone here is a verifier. You get the block, you process the transactions, and you validate that is correct. Well, we normally assume the verifier has sufficient storage and computational resources. So we actually have enough computation, you have a big enough computer to check blocks in real time. In Bitcoin, you can do that with most laptops. And the theory, as I don't know if to run Google Theory, by the way. Who actually runs Google Theory? Oh, we do have some people. Awesome. What's your, what's your computer setup like? Do you have an SSD or? Yeah. No, it works. Okay, you're just doing a better sense of it. What? Bad example. No, this is a good example, because you want to see why it's stacked. But that's important. We always assume the verifier for these people have excessive computational resources to make sure the miners are cheap. Okay? In the convention world, the issue is that the verifier doesn't have the computational resources and the verifier doesn't have any storage. It's the blockchain. The blockchain is the verifier. And we have to rely on third party observers, all of us, to verify that the checkpoint is correct and the data is off chain. And that's fundamentally the difference between you know, a new blockchain protocol, and all of these plasma conditions. Okay? So you're all leaning watchtowers. You know, Pisa is a leaning watchtower. Let's have to get that joke out there. Cool. So, um, this introduces these liveness requirements that the user has to be online. So, yeah. So there's lots of different ways to design these conditions. Okay? And in terms of integrity, we have to worry about checkpoint integrity and whether withdrawals are processed correctly. Okay? So, there's also the third one that's data availability. So, let's just look at integrity to begin with. And there's two ways to do this one using fraud proofs, and the other one using zero knowledge proofs. You know, optimistic, I'll get the optimistic rule up in a second. Let's not say that now, I'll be confusing. So in the fraud proof world, we have interactive fraud proofs where you issue a challenge and someone has to respond. Or in non-interactive fraud proofs, where I just send evidence and I can convince the blockchain immediately that this is incorrect. Okay, so let's look at checkpoint integrity. Okay, so what could happen in some designs is there's checkpoint A, there's 72 hours, and then checkpoint B. There's a 72 hour window for anyone to prove to the blockchain that checkpoint was incorrect. So how do we do that? So as a user, you validated yourself. You get the checkpoint, you get the off-chain data, and you just re-execute all the transactions yourself. Then if you find fraud, what you do is submit a fraud proof. You just point at the blockchain and say, blockchain, execute this one transaction. If you execute it, it's going to be invalid. The blocks will execute it, it will confirm that the checkpoint's invalid, and then just reject it. And that's basically how you, for fraud proofs, you guarantee the integrity for that. But what about withdrawals? Typically in the designs, if you want to withdraw your coin from a commit chain, you say, in checkpoint what? Add 70 coins. And then there's this challenge period where anyone can prove that I may or may not have had 70 coins. If you can send evidence that I'm cheating, you know, maybe I'm the operator and I can give myself 70 coins, then you provide that proof and I'll cancel the withdrawal. Okay, so that's our fraud proof work in a nutshell. Okay, you've seen the sign off of that. So let's move to zero knowledge proof. So can zero knowledge proofs come to the rescue? You know, I still some <laughs> photographers. Yeah, 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 of course we're ready to go that. Don't tell me, Gary. I'm Are you doing yeah, anyway, these are the wizards. So, and the wizards come to the rescue and see of the day. So, what is nice about zero knowledge proofs, like all zero knowledge proofs are really for or verifiable computing. You have a limited resource, I need a large computation, I want to prove it's correct without you having to repeat the work. Okay? So, what we do here is that we post a checkpoint and a proof that the checkpoint is well formed and all of the state transitions are correct. Okay? 
So we actually solve one of the problems. We don't solve checkpoint integrity. Can I always prove to the blockchain that is correct? Okay? And that's not like vision tree. Okay? And this is actually a code I learned a few years ago. You know, uh, what's important to note is that cryptography links here in all these proofs. We're only one tool in an engineer's toolbox. If you think cryptography is going to solve your problem, you don't understand your problem and you don't understand cryptography. So here it only solves one problem and nothing else. It only solves checkpoint integrity. But there's caveats. You know, zero knowledge proofs are slow. Very slow proving time. Uh, you know, a Zcash transaction back in the day would take 50 seconds. Now it takes six seconds. You have now to do this for 10,000 transactions. You know, it's quite slow. On-chain verification isn't always cheap either. Uh, currently, I think the snark is around 800,000 gas, and that's going to get reduced to 100,000 gas in the next hard fork for Ethereum. But that's a big deal. If every blocks get many gas, you can fit in 80 proofs. If these operators are doing, you know, a checkpoint every block, you only have 80 operators on the network. So they're quite expensive. And they're also moon map. So is there anyone here who can actually understand snarks? Raise your hand. One, awesome. <laughs> That's important, is it? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> That's important to moon map. It's sort of hard to verify that it's correct. With all these people in their bedrooms building it, it's hard to verify that the implementation are actually correct. Or that the proof does not bug. Okay? Yeah. Cool. And then the question is, sure you can start just pumping out these blocks now, we get a checkpoint every block we see it today. Now, that's not always true. Because the big problem is data availability. And as I mentioned, this would be the thing stabbing with these commit chains in the back. And there's three plus one ways to solve it, and none of them are really that ideal. So the first one is, this is the plasma cost approach. You just wait for uh, data availability. Okay? What I mean by that, if Bob gets a transfer on the network, he waits for the checkpoint, then he waits to get the off-chain data. And only then does he consider it correct. That works for you with the plasma cost of fixed claim commit chains. But it's not that great, because now you're really like, you know, 10, 20, 30 blocks, because it's even slower than the blockchain. Uh, oh, I, I fixed that slide earlier. Yeah, see, they right break on my slides. Okay, another one is, you could force the availability on the blockchain. Okay? So between every checkpoint, you could say, operator, here's a challenge. You have to respond on the blockchain with my account data. If the operator can't do that before you know the expiry time, then the entire checkpoint is invalidated. That's annoying. Because now, even though that checkpoint is valid and correct, and you have the off-chain data, and the operator fails to respond to one data availability challenge, that will be invalidated. So now you have to wait for this checkpoint to get in, and then for the next checkpoint to get in, before you consider your transfer valid. That's like the new cost approach. So now you can be waiting 72 hours, or I guess, okay, I think it's 36 hours in new cost. But anyway, you can wait like a day and a half, two days, to consider a transfer confirmed. And that's pretty soon. The third one, and this is sort of a starter I came up with for a while, was how an external committee of lost towers. What you do is that the operator will give the zero knowledge proof, let's say, and the checkpoint, and they send it off to the lost tower committee. And they all sign off on it. Then you send it, and there's a happy face. They send it to the blockchain. Then the blockchain is convinced the all chain data was actually made available. Because external parties signed off on that. So it is a solution, but it's, uh, it doesn't really solve the problem because you're just moving into K of N, you know, watch towers now. For pieces, it's good because you build watch towers. But generally, it's protocol design is not that good. So there's three different ways we've solved this so far. You know, one was just you bid for the data, that's cash, on chain challenges, that's no cost, or you have this watch tower committee, that was sort of the SARC pay example. And then the question is well, this looks like a really hard problem. Why don't we just post all the data to the blockchain? You know, give up on the off-chain bit, but we just post it to the blockchain anyway. And that's Rollup. Okay? So Rollup has a stronger verifier assumption. It assumes that a verifier can store data. 
So you boost all the data to the blockchain. Now the difference is that. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. So the difference is that it's no longer off chain because all the data is now on the blockchain. So the question is, are we just back to square one? You know, we tried to go off chain, didn't really work that well. We're now back on chain. Well, what's nice is that it's still layer two. And Roth really more of a compression technique. So last I attacked the current implementation, every Ethereum transaction is 21,000 gas. They compress the data, so every transaction is now 800 gas. So you can really put more data into a block. And remember, all you're doing is storing data in the block. The block is not verifying those transactions. You know, so all that blockchain becomes is a data availability there. You just post lots of data and you post it out to everyone. And that actually solves one of the big bottlenecks, because now the miners no longer need to validate transactions. They just push it in the box. Okay? Oh man, I knew that was going to happen. I saw that. No! I made this slide earlier and I broke it. Okay, so the whole point of that slide was um, there's two ways to guarantee this integrity. There is your ZK rule up, which is where you post the checkpoint, the data, and the zero knowledge proof. The minute that has the blockchain, the blockchain is convinced everything's correct. All the state transitions are correct, and the data is available. The other one is optimistic rollout, where you post the data, the checkpoint, and then there could be a challenge period before you consider that checkpoint confirmed. And within that challenge period, I don't consider fault proof to say blockchain. There's data. I think that's an involved state transition. Blockchain, just repeat that and say it was correct. The blockchain will compute it and say, oh, wait, okay, that is an involved state transition. Then just ignore that and just delete it. And that's basically the difference. Optimistic rule up relies on fault proofs. There's still this delay period of like one or two weeks, let's say. I don't know what time frame they're using. Where anyone can submit proof that there was an invalid state transition or an invalid payment. I say state transition because it could be you know, smart contract and different apps, not just payments. Or for ZK rollup, you post the proof and the block is immediately convinced that the checkpoint is valid. Okay? Cool. So, what I also tried to do is create, I made this little plan a few weeks ago, so take a look at this out. You know, a lot of these designs by these companies are mil like military, you know, military kept secrets. It's hard to get anything out of them. But uh, it sort of shows the evolution of these conditions. You know, no cost, for example, and I support zero knowledge proofs for checkpoint integrity, they have on chain availability challenges, where you get down the rollout, the optimistic rollout, and now you don't even need any watch towers potentially, but everything's on chain. So, really, these conventions have just slowly, slowly evolved. From the original Plasma paper to the academic paper to E3 search to roll up. And now we've got to the point where there's a bunch of cool solutions. We now understand what the design space looks like for these conventions. So it feels like the Lightning Network in 2015. So there's like dummy implementations out there. We have a really good idea now on how to take this forward. Okay, so this brings up user language requirements. Okay? So should the user have to watch out? for invalid withdrawals? You know, should you have a challenge period for withdrawals? Should the user be responsible for holding the hub accountable? You know, what I mean by that is, should the customer be responsible for issuing data availability challenges? I mean, if you're, the option data is available. And should the hub, should the hub be responsible for responding to on-chain challenges? As a hub, I have millions of customers. They can all issue me a challenge. And I've got one many responses to do one chain. So that's just a DOS factor. But we don't actually have good answers to this. Okay? And also, this is another slide. And this is sort of going from fraud proofs to zero knowledge proofs. You know, I think some of the numbers over there for proving times are incorrect. But I forgot what the correct answer was, so I didn't fix it. Uh, that can be fixed in the future. Anyway, so the point there is that we ran the fraud proof approach, it's really cheap. And a commission for fraud proofs. All I post are hashes, you know, 32 bytes. So you're going to imagine that's still a bit better. But when we get down to the snark and start, and snarks are constant size, okay, it's 500 guys, and then 100 guys. But that's still bigger than the fraud proof. And then starts, you know, they, they can go up to 8 million guys. 
you know, give or take the, the throughput they're handling. And that's important, you know, that's to say Star Pay took off and they were doing 10,000, 20,000 transactions per second, they would occupy the entire pocket of Ethereum, that one operator. Where Snarks, as I mentioned, they're private or take us, you may get 100 Snarks per block, and maybe more when that goes down. And if it's just a hash, you get thousands. So that needs to be taken into consideration as an operator. The point here is that if I want to run my own commission, that's my ongoing cost. Every time there comes a checkpoint, I have to pay for this. If I trust myself, maybe I'll just go with the hash approach. If I want to convince you guys that you don't have to trust me, maybe I'm willing to pay the price to verify a smart blockchain or any store stock. So as an operator, that's some of the financial implications for this. But no one really talks about it. Okay, so for commit chains at least, what I want to highlight is actually, I believe in the future, most services on the internet will run a commit chain. It will hopefully just be a WordPress plugin, similar to that. Then you offer self custody to your customers. You know, but what you need to think about with these designs is, you know, the ongoing financial cost, the hub's appetite that a checkpoint could be deemed invalid, the cost of a watching service, is there a trust of setup or not? Uh, the speed of withdrawal and getting the speed of confirmation of checkpoint. So in plasma cash, you gotta have rapid checkpoints. In no cost, you have to wait 36 hours between every checkpoint. There's all these design decisions that you have to take into consideration. But you know, welcome to the trust but verify future. Now, I'm gonna be finished by the way. I do have a hidden, another hidden part of this talk. And that's actually all of these on-chain protocols have one big underlying assumption, except for ZK Mobile. They assume you use it online and synchronize with the network. So what I mean by that, and I sort of alluded to it, okay, this is this is almost really silly. All this involved with a payment channel, all this want a poker game, let's say, or a bottle ship game, and I said one million Bitcoin. So go offline and to go buy a lamp. And she has this in my So what Bob can do. You can try to trigger a dispute and get back his $1 million from the payment channel. So he sends the evidence where he still has the $1 million. And then Alice comes along, and the question is, you know, will Alice wake up and save the day, or will Bob get away with it? In this case, Alice comes online at, at the last moment, so send the evidence, and so he manages to save her $1 million. But that sort of sucks. You know, now you need to have a node or something online that's watching the blockchain on your behalf. So what we were working on two years ago was can we help alleviate this new security requirement? And this is sort of where the watchtower idea comes in, with these maybe watchtowers. You can hire someone else to do it for you. Now typically, over the past, I would say, four or five years now, the typical perception of a watching network is the following. The user has done something off-chain. And now they want to hire a watchtower. What they do is they're going to hire 22 watchtowers. Okay? And now all 22 watchtowers are watching to protect the customer. So then there's a problem on, oh, and that's the main question is, does the user have to pay 22 watchtowers, you know, to protect them? And that's a bit crazy. So what people normally advocate is this on-chain bounty approach. The first watchtower to respond will get the money. And the other boss towers will simply lose out. So they broadcast, if there's a job on the blockchain and they broadcast it, bam, they all compete, and only one tower gets the job. Now, this sucks a little bit. Because what if this is only a $5 reward? You just have to store a job for, let's say, three weeks, and then you didn't even get rewarded for doing that. And in Bitcoin, this is a problem. Because of the way, as we, Learned, you know, about, I guess, an hour ago now. In Lightning channels, there's one model of state, and there's a set of revoked states. And every revoked state has a unique justice transaction. So the watchtower has to store order in justice transactions. So if you do 1,000 payments in a Lightning channel, the watchtower has to store, the watchtower has to store 999 justice transactions for that. And that's a lot of storage. You know, every transaction is like 500 bytes. Uh, so if you store, uh, say, 999 jobs, you don't get paid for that, I mean, that's not really going to work that well. The other one is Ethereum, and this is unique to Ethereum. You know, if you hire 22 watchtowers, one tower will respond and get the reward, 
The other 21 MOS towers will still respond. But they'll get a field transaction. And now they have to pay for that field transaction. So you're even get, you know, not, it's not even that you just don't get the reward. You have to pay for the field reward. And that sucks, you know, you're not even losing money trying to protect the customer. But the ultimate problem is more like an ideological one. Are the miners? What if the miners are part of this you know, watching network? They can front run everyone, because they create blocks. You know, they store the job, they create a block, they dissect it, and they outcompete everyone here. You know, you really care about decentralization, you don't want the miners to take on this role. Even if they're best place to do that. And then the worst case scenario is that, what if no one responds? You have 22 watts powers and they all ignore you. Customer comes back online, there's no evidence, no reward, tough luck, users lost money. No, that's a pretty bad user experience. So the question is, why, why do we have this design in mind? Every time someone talks about a relay network, a watching network, a responding network, why do they have this design in mind? Typically it's because, one, they want to minimize trust. You have 22 watts towers, because you don't trust any of them. You're just hoping one is honest. You're also hoping for high availability. What if they go offline? Hopefully one's online to respond for me. But the third one is also this is fair reward. You want to make sure the wasp are actually paid for doing their job. You know, if they don't respond, they shouldn't get paid. So one thing we were thinking of was mostly, how do we solve the, you know, how do we help alleviate that, you know, trust minimization? Is there a way to hire one must tower and still minimize trust? And we think the best way is financial accountability. You can hold the must tower accountable. So that's PISA. The idea of PISA is that there's a leading tower with skin in the game. There's a PISA contract and it has a large security deposit. So the customer comes along, they hire PISA, and then PISA will send over a signed receipt. So now the customer has evidence that they've actually hired the watch tower. So if there's a dispute, you know, all is involved in payments, all is hires pizza, all is goes offline, all tries to cheat, all is pizza's is responsible for all of his behalf. You know, it's very straightforward. But then the question is what if pizza doesn't respond? Can all do anything about it? So the point here is that there's a security deposit on the blockchain. Then all of have the same receipt that they hire pizza, and there's on chain evidence that pizza didn't do his job. So Alice can simply send proof to the blockchain. Then the smart contract says, well, Pizza cheated. They didn't even satisfy this quality of service. So now there's this refund period where Pizza has to refund the customer a pre agreed amount, otherwise it's going to get slashed and lose its steam. So it's financially accountable for its actions. So you know, either you refund the customer or you get slashed and lose your money. And that's nice. This is like one of these staking protocols. And we're probably going to see a lot more of this in the future with a lot more services. I offer a service on the internet, I put skin in the game, and I promise you a quality of service. But I don't give it to you, I have to refund you or I get smashed. And that's quite a nice outcome. And just to finish, because I know we're all quite tired, um, the whole point of these WASP powers with these off chain networks, what they should be is really more like insurance, or they take on financial liability. So if you want to go offline, there's this third party that will take on some liability for you. I promise you this quality of service. The WASP power cannot protect you if you get hacked. If you get hacked or there's an insider threat, it cannot protect you. It can only protect you if you go offline or if you crash. Cool. Now I'm just going to wrap up with one more slide. Okay, so given everything I've spoken about tonight, how are these networks going to evolve in the coming years? Like, well, that's like my vision around that. So the first is going to be this peer-to-peer -peer routing network. As I mentioned before, anyone here can open a lightning channel. Anyone here can join lightning. And anyone here can route payments on the network. But the question is, I sort of alluded that I didn't think lightning was great for payments. It can do payments, and it's definitely going to do payments in the short term. But long term, you know, where are the payments going to be? Where's all this sending the coins to? I think it's going to be these non-custodial hubs. It could be the payment channel hubs, or it could be the commit chains. So I'm over there, and then I want to send coins to another service, I'll get you know, across the Lightning Network. And then finally, you're going to have this watching network that just takes on the financial liability and offers insurance to all the players in this uh, off-chain network. Then the blockchain is pretty much 
more like a court or a settlement system that's no longer responsible for processing every transaction. But most people look at me and they think, Paddy, you're a bit crazy. This is like blue sky. This is never going to exist. You're too much of an academic. But actually, companies are building this. You know, you look at the channel based networks, you have Flatly, Riley, you have Ford, Blockchain, Maternity, Arwin. You have these non custodial hubs, you have Starker, Liquidity Network, Plasma Group. And we're really the only ones building watch networks, so no one wants to build this. But uh, well, that's important. You know, companies are actually building this out, and sometimes I get the impression they have no idea about the big bigger picture. You know, they're just sort of siloed in what they're building. So that's cool. You know, this is sort of evolving. Hopefully, in the coming years, we can all play out. I mean, there's lots of them now you can play with, but there's sort of practice. So that's the end of the talk. I hope I didn't do it. But, oh, okay, that's good. Cool. Yeah. 
And also the same repeatedly. I mean, the more they're doing this, you should have some confidence they're not just going to cheat you. Hopefully. You know, this is a limited trust. Any other questions? Yeah. I was wondering what the storage implications were of something roll up for your posting. Yeah, so I only, I only describe roll up as like a, a compression technique where we just, it sort of takes a con down a little bit. You know, you're still posting all that data. So there's going to be a scaling where we get to the point where we can't scale anymore. Just because of information propagation, or maybe certain nodes can no longer store a huge option for network scaling. Uh, oh, I don't know what those limitations would be right now. I mean, it will eventually happen at some point. Any other question? So, the only thing you selected for me to think is what is the actual routing? Between, so, the reason why you would do that uh, route lightning here, and this is why I'm extremely good at Charlotte. So, all these commit chains, they could be GANs, they could be. I don't see pens, I'm more of a pen person. I'm not very good at GANs. But here it could be pens. Now, I want to start where we're there. Uh, maybe I'm going to move with a pay pop. But you normally do is you use it. Here, you use Lightning. And why do you use Lightning? Why don't I have another commission in there? And Lightning, the minute that transfer is sent across, is instant. There's no credit party risk. You know, I don't have to trust any of these peers in the middle. So this operator and this operator don't have to agree on who can send it to. They use the Lightning network and they get sent across in a few seconds. And that's why you have Lightning there. What's also exciting about them is that it's also peer to peer. So if one path feels, because that's the same middle of the FBI are there. No, that's not FBI, that's not the other positions. That just says uh, someone who doesn't like it. You can just get another path around them. So it's actually more it's actually more sensitive resistant than Bitcoin. It was really exciting. Any other questions or Okay, cool. I think we're all exhausted, so I guess I know there's any pizza left. So thank you guys for coming.